Thank you very much, Dan, for that kind, uh, gracious uh, introduction. Uh, as I said last night, when a similar introduction was made, it makes me feel very old to have done all that. Um, when I came in here, I got this headgear on with the, the microphone. It made me feel slightly uh, alarmed, especially when I was having an ordinary conversation and I heard my voice booming out of the speakers. It reminded me of an incident where I was in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York a few years ago. And one of the priests, halfway through this service, unexpectedly stood up and left the, uh, uh, the altar uh, and walked in, very, in a very pious way, uh, slowly, majestically, to the side of the altar. And then he forgot to switch off his microphone. And we all heard his footsteps echoing on the marble, and then the tinkle of water, <laughs> and then the flushing of the cistern. And then he came back onto the altar, looking very pious, And we all thought, we know where you've been. <laughs> I want to tell the story of uh, Pope Francis, and it's an unexpected story. When I set out to um, write the book about him, I didn't know this was going to be the story. It was an extraordinary thing to discover. He's a man who's been on a huge personal journey, and uh, he's a man who's learned from his mistakes in a big way. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit of that story today. Within minutes of him being elected as Pope, the internet was buzzing with people saying, who is this man? Jorge Mario Bergoglio, he was called. What was he like? He was a Jesuit. So Jesuits got lots of emails from people saying, who is he? What's he like? And what they replied was far from flattering. And one uh, friend of mine showed me an email he'd received from one of the most senior Jesuit figures uh, in Latin America. He was the leader of the Jesuits in another country. And uh, he wrote this about the man who was not uh, uh, then the Pope. This was written about two days before he became Pope. Uh, he came out onto the, to the balcony and um, uh, gave us this very smiling face. But the face that we'd heard about, the stories from Argentina, were of a much sterner man. Uh, the email said this, yes, I, I know Bergoglio, he's a person who's caused a lot of problems in the society and he's highly controversial in his own country. In addition to being accused of having allowed the arrest of two Jesuits during the time of the Argentinian dictatorship, as provincial, that's the leader, he generated divided loyalties. Some groups almost worshipped him, while others would have nothing to do with him and he would hardly speak to them. It was an absurd situation. He's well trained and very capable, uh, <clears throat> but is surrounded by a personality cult which is extremely divisive. It will be a catastrophe for the church if someone like him is appointed to the Holy See. He left the Society of Jesus in Argentina in ruins with Jesuits divided, institutions destroyed, financially broken. We have spent two decades trying to fix the chaos that this man left us. What an extraordinary email to see. And could this be the, the same man, this simple, uh, humble man who had appeared on the balcony and before he did anything else, he asked the people of God to pray over him before he would give them their blessing, his blessing, he wanted their blessing. And yet we hear this, this, this blast of an email against him. And it wasn't a single email. I, as I began to research the book, I was told a similar story by three very senior members of the Jesuits uh, in, in which uh, Bergoglio played a leading role in that religious order until the, uh, he was aged 50. And such was the level of discontent amongst Jesuits that the Jesuit headquarters in Rome, the Jesuit Curia, began ordering the Jesuits around the world, uh, as they put it, to be prudent in their recollections of uh, uh, the, the Bergoglio and to keep to themselves any unhappy memories they might have of the new Pope. So what on earth could generate this strength of feeling? I set out for Argentina uh, and Rome to find out. This is him as a young priest. People writing about him uh, early on pointed out that he was the first uh, Pope who had been ordained a priest after the Second Vatican Council. And the Va Vatican II was that great revolutionary change of culture within the Catholic Church in the 60s 
which transformed the church from a body which was very inwardly focused on its own sacramental life to one which was much more prepared to engage with the outside world and to embrace what was good there and to challenge and seek to change what was not. But to say that Bergoglio was the first pope who was made a priest after Vatican II is to give you a bit of a bum steer because Bergoglio's formation as a priest was essentially in that pre-Vatican II era. Um, and when the Second Vatican Council came, the Jesuits in Argentina divided into those who wanted to embrace it and change the way that they related to the world and, and to their faith, and those who wanted to stay as they were. And Bergoglio was one of those who was in this more reactionary camp. What you need to know about uh, the Second Vatican Council was the way that it worked itself through in um, Latin America was uh, through something which developed called liberation theology. Now you'll hear a lot of caricatures about liberation theology to suggest that it's, it's somehow um, a Marxist uh, way of looking at the world. And it was influenced by Marxist uh, analysis of, so of social and economic categories, but it's a much richer thing than, uh, than is often um, portrayed. It sought uh, and still seeks to combine the spiritual liberation of people with their economic and political and social liberation. It says the church has to stand alongside poor people uh, in their struggle to uh, control their own destiny. Not everybody in the Jesuits agreed with this. Um, some of them said it's okay to go out into the slums and and, and uh, uh, hold services to say, say mass, um, but the, the, that, that is sufficient uh, of contact with the poor. And th they wanted to keep their existing spirituality and they wanted to continue their main social role, which was educating the children of the country's elite. So the traditionalists were backed by the bishops in Argentina who were a, a conservative group. Uh, and they were unimpressed with this new idea that God gives preference to the impoverished and the marginalized, the idea of the bias to the poor, the preferential option for the poor, which was the phrase from liberation theology. And the Vatican took a similar line because it saw liberation theology, which was very much people at the bottom up doing things for themselves. Uh, it saw that as a threat to the authority and the hierarchy of the Vatican, which was much more top down. So in this period, in the Jesuits in um, Argentina, the provincial was a man called uh, Ricardo O'Farrell. This is him. He was a sociologist and he embraced the changes of Vatican II and of liberation theology. And he supported the idea of ordinary people getting together and reading the Bible for themselves rather than just having it read to them uh, in chunks on a Sunday. Um, and in these base communities of people, they, they, they were taught to read, they could read the Bible for themselves, they could discuss what that meant uh, for uh, the, uh, the lives that they led and how it interacted with that. They could plan their own liturgies, but they could also plan their own social action. And O'Farrell encouraged his Jesuits to work with poor people in the slums. The more conservative group were unhappy with this and, uh, and the rapid uh, uh, pace of change that happened in the order and they staged a rebellion. They contacted the Jesuits in Rome and said this man is dividing our group, we need a different leader. And Rome listened and they appointed Jorge Mario Bergoglio who was uh, very young, he was only 36, which is very young for a, uh, a leader of the whole province. Uh, but he was made leader uh, in what was effectively an internal coup within the organisation. He was um, a very a young but very charismatic figure and he'd been very highly regarded for many years um, by both his fellows and his superiors so much so that he'd been made novice master in charge of the training of new recruits um, even before he'd taken his final vows as a Jesuit and it was uh, um, just three months after he took those perpetual vows that he was made leader of uh, um, the Jesuits in the entire country. And he set about immediately reversing some of the changes that O'Farrell had brought in. This is a picture of the uh, chapel in the sem seminary. It was a conventional chapel, and O'Farrell had had it changed into, uh, when you go into it still, it's like, a, it's like walking into a, a cave, a catacomb, or as he saw it, a Bedouin tent 
because he saw that the people of God were on a journey, a pilgrimage, and so they should be thinking in, in different ways. Um, the traditionalists didn't like it, Bergoglio didn't like it, and he reordered this chapel uh, along uh, more traditional lines, more reverential lines, as he, as he put it, uh, and he made changes in the way that the order was doing things. He changed the liturgy, replaced the modern uh, songs with the old uh, pre-conciliar songs and chants, and, um, and he changed the curriculum, moving, removing all the Vatican II inspired books from the reading list, and even from the library, and he sought out conservative lay professors to replace the Jesuit teachers who he thought were too progressive. And most of the thing that the Jesuits found hardest of all to forgive him for was that he gave away one of the Jesuit universities to a right-wing Peronist organization called the Iron Guard, uh, which was, to which he was the spiritual advisor, and liberation theology was forbidden. So we see here a very different man to the man who is now Pope Francis. He was concerned for the poor even then. Uh, he helped set up soup kitchens and distribute medicines and blankets. But his main purpose for his priests when he sent them out into uh, the poor areas was to uh, gather the children for teaching, catechesis, and for mass. His model of relating to the poor was one of charity. He thought they were people who needed help rather than a model of social justice. And he banned his priests from working with uh, political organizations in the slums, but even self-help groups, unions, cooperatives, and uh, Catholic NGOs in the slums. And in those days, the man who later became famous as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, who went round on the subway uh, and didn't have a chauffeur-driven car, in those days, he did have a chauffeur-driven car, and I talked to this man who was his chauffeur, uh, one of the Jesuit priests, Mom de Bucy is his name, the one with spectacles, talking there to Bergoglio. Now in this period, um, Bergoglio was a very dynamic and strong leader, but his clarity of purpose and his auto autocratic style of leadership brought problems. And one of his students told me, if you liked him and he liked you, you'd be in a good position. But if he didn't like you, then you were in for some kind of trouble and you would be relegated outside the circle of power. Argentina's Jesuits soon divided into two groups, those who loved him and those who loathed him. The first event which really changed him occurred during the Dirty War when there was a, a right-wing uh, military dictatorship took over Argentina and they seized any critics who were um, uh, even vaguely critical of him, the, uh, as, as the years went by, they, uh, you didn't have to do much to, uh, to get disappeared. Uh, 30,000 opponents were disappeared, as the phrase was, and many of them were, were thrown alive from aircraft into the sea. A few months after this coup, two Jesuit priests, Orlando Yorio and Franz Yalix, were kidnapped by the military, uh, and they were tortured and jailed for five months. And Bergoglio's critics said that he'd betrayed these men to this military death squad. Bergoglio's friends say, no, that's nonsense. He worked bravely behind the scenes during the military dictatorship to smuggle people out of the country who the army were after, and there's no doubt that he did do that. But those two claims of betrayal and of bravery are not incompatible. And I go to, to some lengths in the book to scrutinize the evidence uh, on this uh, thorny issue. And I conclude that Bergoglio didn't betray the men, but that he did um, treat them in a reckless way, which the military interpreted as a green light to snatch them. So why was that? The problem was this. This is Yalix, one of them. He's the, the one that's still alive, in, and he lives in Germany in a retreat house now. Yorio and Yalix had been Bergoglio's teachers. They were older than him, and they'd been living and working in the slums with the blessing of the previous provincial of Farrell. The older men and the young provincial uh, locked horns. They refused to obey his order to leave the slums in which they lived, and they began writing a defense of their position, uh, which they later sent to Rome. But Goglio was outraged. He, one of the key vows that Jesuits take is of obedience, and Yorio and Yalix were in flagrant violation of that vow of obedience. And he said to them, if you don't do what you're told, you have effectively expelled yourselves from the order. And when they didn't uh, do what he asked, uh, he informed the Archbishop of Buenos Aires 
who withdrew the two men's permission to say mass. Now, Bergoglio should have known the danger that he was putting the men into because he was politically astute. He's not, he's not an innocent character. He was well informed about the military's repressive behavior and three of his Jesuits were military chaplains who kept him informed. But anger with the two men clouded his judgment and he behaved badly. And later, uh, he came to recognize that and he began to atone for his behavior. At this point in the story, the world began to change around Bergoglio. Uh, he was the leader of the Jesuits for 15 years, first as uh, novice master, then provincial, then as rector of the seminary, uh, until 1986. But three years before he finished, in 1983, this military junta uh, collapsed in Argentina and democracy was restored. Geopolitical situation altered. The Cold War was, was warming. The changes of the Vatican uh, Council, which had spread throughout Latin America, began to spread uh, more even through conservative Argentina. And the Jesuits were still split into those who liked him and those who didn't, but his critics began to outnumber his supporters. So when his term of office as rector came to an end, his Jesuit superiors in Rome decided he needed to be removed from Argentina so these divisions in the order could begin to heal, and they sent him to study in Germany. But he didn't like uh, uh, um, Germany, and he re returned to Argentina after just six months, and he became an ordinary priest living in, an or in a Jesuit house in Buenos Aires. But he couldn't get used to the idea that he wasn't the leader, and he kept criticizing the new leaders and the principal of the college and the head of the house in which he lived. He was always telling them what they were doing was wrong, and eventually fed up with his meddling, uh, the provincial in the new provincial in Argentina, in consultation with the Jesuits in Rome, sent him into exile. And he was sent to Cordoba, which is the, a, a provincial city in Argentina, about 400 miles away. So the man who had been the kingpin of this province for 15 years felt suddenly he'd been sidelined side and belittled. And one of his aides told me Cordoba was for Bergoglio a place of humility and humiliation. But this is the amazing part of the story. In Cordoba, something happened. He underwent an extraordinary transformation. And in exile, I suggest in, in the book, and the Pope later went on to confirm in his first interview in Rome, he had in Cordoba what he called a time of great interior crisis. Now, it's not possible to see into another person's soul, but what is pretty clear was that Bergoglio found a way of seeing deeper into his own soul in this period. He's always been a man of deep prayer. When he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he used to rise about uh, before 5 a.m. so that he could spend two hours in silent prayer in front of the tabernacle before he began his working day. It's difficult to overstate the importance of prayer to this Pope. His, uh, one of his close aides, Father Guillermo Marco, uh, told me he likes to Sorry. He likes to uh, wake at 4.30 um, and, uh, and pray. Prayer is so important to him um, that as Archbishop he would rarely accept invitations to dinner because he knew if he went out to dinner he wouldn't be able to get up at 4.30. And he didn't want to miss his prayer time because he has a very strong relationship with God. And he makes all his decisions while he prays. Now Jesuits spent 15 years in formation and one of the techniques they use is something called the spiritual exercises. And these were devised by their founder, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, uh, 500 years ago. And at the heart of these exercises, they're a kind of process of discernment, whereby you, you look inside yourself and you burrow down into the layers to find out what it is, in what way are you fooling yourself? How are you deluding yourself? How, in what ways are you hiding from God? And during that period, those kind of layers of self-justification and self-delusion, um, Bergoglio underwent the spiritual exercises again in Cordoba, and all of this contributed to this kind of change. And he had two years there in which to reflect on his divisive leadership previously of the Jesuits and what he'd done wrong or inadequately during the, the um, dirty war. And he had to confront the fact 
that in his inexperience as a young leader, he'd allowed the breakdown of the pastoral relationships between him and some of the priests in his care. Now in those days, the man who never stops giving press conferences and uh, impromptu speeches now as Pope, rarely, rarely gave interviews. But he gave one in 2010 to two Argentinian journalists, and it was a long one. Uh, they made a book out of it. And in that, he looked back on those early years as the Jesuits, and, and he said that, that's the Argentinian flag there. He said at this point, I don't want to mislead anyone. The truth is, I'm a sinner who God in his mercy has, shown, has chosen to love in a privileged manner. From a young age, life pushed me into leadership roles and I had to learn from my errors along the way because to tell you the truth, I made hundreds of errors. It would be wrong for me to say these days I ask forgiveness for the sins and the offenses I might have committed. Today I ask forgiveness for the sins and offenses that I did indeed commit. And he said this is something similar in his very first interview as Pope. The interviewer uh, just began by saying, who is Jorge, Jorge Mario Bergoglio? And the Pope sat for a long time before he answered. And he said, I am a sinner. That is the most accurate definition. It is not a figure of speech or a literary genre. I am a sinner. And he went on to confess, my style of government as a Jesuit at the beginning had many faults. I found myself provincial when I was still very young. I was only 36 years old. That was crazy. I had to deal with difficult situations and I made my decisions abruptly and by myself. My authoritarian and quick manner of making decisions led me to have serious problems and to be accused of being ultra conservative. I lived a time of great interior crisis when I was in Cordoba. But what was important was not that he made mistakes, but that he learned from them. And later he said this, for me, feeling that you have sinned is one of the most beautiful things that can happen to a person. Because sin, properly assumed, is the privileged place of personally finding Jesus Christ, our Saviour. It's the possibility to live in the wonder of having been saved. Now there was more to this than an insight, and there was more to it than remorse. In the conversations that he had with one of the leading Jewish thinkers in Argentina, which produced another book, uh, Ab R R Rabbi Abraham Skorka, Bergoglio spoke about guilt, and he said this, guilt by itself is just another human resource. Guilt without atonement doesn't allow us to grow. And to those Argentinian interviewers, he said, there is no clean slate. We have to bless the past with remorse, forgiveness, and atonement. The regret is not sufficient, there has to be change. And acutely aware of his own mistakes and frailties, Bergoglio, in those years of exile, devised a strategy to handle them and to try to atone for the errors of his past. And he emerged from those two years in the wilderness, transformed into a new man entirely. He became a bishop in 1992, very unusually for a Jesuit. Um, but he, while he was in exile, the archbishop said, that man's wasted in exile, let's take him out of the Jesuits and put him into an ordinary job in the church. And he was made an assistant bishop. And what he did uh, in, when he returned to the city of his birth in 1992 was that he'd, shown for, he'd transformed from this conservative authoritarian figure into this icon of humility, radical humility, who we see uh, in office today. And he developed a new model of leadership, one in which involved consultation and participation and collegiality and listening. And he went to the slums, taking the subway this time, not uh, a chauffeur-driven car, and he spent long, long hours with uh, the poorest of the poor. One of the slum priests, as they call them in, in Argentina, told me that over his 18 years as bishop and archbishop, where Bergoglio became actually known as the bishop of the slums, he said he must have talked personally to at least half the people in this slum, and there were 10,000 people in the slums. 
He said he would just turn up and he would wander the alleyways and chat to the locals and drink tea with them. He didn't always dress uh, in, in his ecclesiastical finery like that, but there he is saying mass in a slum uh, and the contrast between the vestments and uh, the surroundings are quite striking. There he is drinking mate, it's a herbal tea which you, you pass around, it's almost like a communion, you share it with the group as, as you drink. And Bergoglio would go and he would um, bless fa the families and the children and the paintings and, uh, and just chat to people in, in everyday situations. And this was another key moment in his transformation because he, the contact with poor people began to change him in, in other ways. Uh, he, he began to learn he, that in the slums there were huge problems of, of drugs and prostitution, but he began to see that the, the drug addicts and the drug dealers rather, and, and the prostitutes, were not people who were the villains of the piece, they were people who in their own way were victims, and he saw a more complex um, picture of poverty and, and the, uh, the social reality behind it. One of his great maxims is, realities are greater than ideas. And that's a big change from previous popes. You couldn't imagine a previous pope saying that reality is greater than ideas. Uh, the last pope was a theologian, the one before him was a philosopher. Ideas were important to them. But he developed what we're seeing now as, as pope, this sense of um, pastoral instinct coming out of the profound realism that comes from a priest who observes people and listens to them. And that's why as Pope he's always saying that a, a, a pastor must smell of his sheep. A shepherd must smell the smell of his sheep. And uh, in his sermons, we've since heard how he learned from, from these people, from the, the uh, elderly woman in the care home whose children only visit her once a year at Christmas or from the children from broken marriages who grow up terrified of making a commitment of their own, or the fathers who don't see their children because of their long working hours, or the women who are cheated because they're denied equal pay when they go out to work and their families suffer as a consequence. And these are the situations that he now wants to see touched by God's mercy. This is a woman who's known as a Cartanero. They live on the, um, the slums uh, in... Uh, on the, the rubbish heaps in the slums, and they sort through um, looking for anything they can sell to re that can be recycled. And Bergoglio helped them form uh, a trade union, which uh, was something that 20 years before he would have opposed, but now here he was um, looking at the economic structures which kept people at the bottom and doing what he could to empower people to make something of their own lives. And he began to look at the economic situation in Buenos Aires, and see that some of the economic structures were, as he would put it, structures of sin. There was inequality built into them and they needed to be changed. And he began to see that what the poor needed was, was not charity, but social justice. So he quadrupled the number of priests serving in the slums. One of them said, to one of these uh, five here said to me, uh, he became concerned not just with holy water, but with water pressure in the pipes. And he began, began to back the kind of groups that he'd opposed 20 years earlier. So that's the social fruit of this change. There was a personal fruit as well. And um, when uh, Bergoglio uh, came out of this wilderness of exile, some years into that, he met Yalix again, uh, one of the two Jesuits who'd been handicapped and uh, kidnapped and, uh, and shackled and hooded and tortured. And the two men met uh, in a retreat house in Germany. And one of the people who was present uh, told me that the, the two of them fell into each other's arms and cried. And it was a visceral intermingling of, of relief and remorse and repentance. And the change in Bergoglio sprang from deep within his soul. If there's one word that characterizes the ministry of Pope Francis, it's mercy. It's been the repeated theme of his preaching as Pope and before that as Archbishop. When he became a bishop, he chose a, a quotation in Latin from um, a commentary on Matthew's Gospel, miserando atque eligiando, and that means, loosely translated, choosing through the eyes of mercy. He felt that God had chosen him, had been merciful in choosing him. 
Just before he left for Rome and the conclave which elected him Pope, Bergoglio wrote what turned out to be his last Lenten address to the people of Buenos Aires. And in it he said, Morality is not never falling down, but always getting up again. And that is a response to God's mercy. Mercy has been, that's him chatting with an ordinary person on a tube in Buenos Aires. Mercy has been the greatest of his themes as Pope. In his first message at Angelus after his election, he told the crowds in St. Peter's Square, the word mercy changes everything. It's the best thing we can hear, it changes the world. A little bit of mercy makes the world less cold and more just. Here he is hugging and he went on to kiss this man with these hideous boils all over his face. And it was a moment that you could, you could just imagine uh, was a moment from the gospel. Uh, a man who would re repel and repulse the rest of us was, was embraced by the Pope. Mercy. And he continued, the story of the adulterous woman whom Jesus saves from being condemned to death captures Jesus' attitude. We do not hear words of contempt or words of condemnation. We only hear words of love and mercy that invite us to conversion. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. God's face is the face of a merciful father who is always patient. In his first um, homily as Pope, he said, In my opinion, the strongest message of the Lord is mercy. And after World Youth Day in Brazil, a few months after his election, he said, I believe this time is a kairos for mercy. Kairos, the Greek, test, the Greek term from the New Testament, meaning a, a privileged moment in God's plan for salvation. In his Lenten message this year, he said, How greatly I desire that all those places where the church is present, especially in our parishes and communities, may become islands of mercy in the midst of of a sea of indifference. And most recently, Pope Francis declared an extraordinary jubilee of mercy to begin on December the 8th this year, the 50th anniversary of that Second Vatican Council. And announcing it, he wrote, mercy is the force that reawakens us to new life and instills in us the courage to look forward to the future with hope. I think the story that I've told will indicate to you, or well, my intuition is certainly, that all of this is not abstract, it's not theological, it's not merely theological. In my view, having talked to dozens of people who know him well, including several people he still rings every week in Buenos Aires, this is, as well as being th theological, it is autobiographical. This is a man who feels that he has experienced the mercy of God after the mistakes that he's made. And I'll just conclude by saying that when a man is elected Pope, he's asked if he accepts the job. He's asked in Latin, and the response, the normal response in Latin is, accepto, I accept. But Bergoglio didn't say, I accept. He said, I am a great sinner, trusting in the mercy of God and the patience of God in suffering, I accept. So the story of Jorge Mario Bergoglio the man who is Pope Francis, is the story of a man who sinned, but who changed. And he changed profoundly, and he changed radically. And now he's come to change a church that has sinned, and he is changing that too, and he's bringing that message to this country, and it's a message of mercy, and then of change which follows. Thank you.